A financial and economic crisis is rocking the world. Politicians promise action. My administration is working with Congress to address the root cause behind much of the instability in our markets. That's why my administration is committed to doing all that's necessary to address this crisis and lead us to a better day. But what kind of action is needed? Where should we turn for answers? There are lessons to be learned from history. We ignore them at our peril. The history of the Great Depression is a good place to begin. The year was 1919, and the world was beginning its recovery from the devastation of World War I. As the soldiers returned home, so did a sense of normalcy. And in the United States, a general return to economic prosperity greater than that experienced before the war. The period was not without its ups and downs. In fact, the Depression of 1920 to 1921 saw the sharpest decline in gross national product and wholesale prices in recorded history. But the American economy rebounded quickly. The Depression ended in just over a year and gave way to a period of prosperity known as the Roaring Twenties. However, the next economic downturn, the crisis of 1929, would turn out very differently. A series of disastrous economic policy decisions turned what would have been an economic downturn into what we now know as the Great Depression. Amity Schles, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and author of The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, explained how an economic crisis turned into a world-shattering catastrophe. In, in the 1920s, we had a stock market crash, but it didn't have to be a depression. And then when we had a depression, the depression didn't have to last till World War II, but it did. And in each instance, there were discrete policy errors that made a bad situation worse. President Herbert Hoover was an outspoken advocate of special barriers to trade with people in foreign countries, a policy known as protectionism. One of Hoover's first acts upon becoming president in 1929 was to hold a special session of Congress on tariffs, the taxes imposed on goods imported from abroad. Hoover later wrote in his memoirs that he believed a high tariff on agricultural products would help the U.S. farmer by building up his domestic market, since imported goods would then be too expensive for people to afford. Hoover thought that artificially raising prices for domestic agricultural goods would increase the income of American farmers and create greater demand for industrial goods. The now notorious Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act was passed by Congress in June of 1930 and signed into law by President Hoover. It represented a huge increase in tariffs on imported goods. The big tariff was called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. That's a great name and we still refer to it and it was a frightening tariff. It did cut trade in the U.S. by half with foreign nations. So it had a dramatic effect at a dramatic time when the stock market was also falling by more than half. So there was um, trouble in the U.S. economy. The stock market had crashed and Smoot-Hawley made it all worse. The Smoot-Hawley tariff went well beyond increasing taxes on imported farm goods. By the time the bill was passed by the Congress, special interest groups of every kind had been able to cash in at the expense of American consumers and other less politically connected industries. The bill included special taxes on sugar, wheat, beef, cotton, textiles, leather and shoes, wool and wool products, velvet, decorative china, glass surgical instruments, pocket knives, and watch movements. Tariffs were raised on over 20,000 imported items. Of course, the people who had to pay the price to protect the chosen industries were American consumers and American businesses. Anyone who had to buy any of the goods covered by the tariff in order to go about their daily business. The politicians didn't understand that you cannot create wealth by blocking trade. Exchange creates wealth by allowing people to exchange what they make for what others make. Each participant in the exchange can specialize in what he or she produces at the lowest cost. Trade is based on mutual gains. Blocking trade only makes the economic pie smaller. The special interests can gain if, as they make the pie smaller, they get a much bigger share of it. But everyone else gets a smaller share of a smaller pie. Protectionism impoverishes. Protectionism creates conflict between the interests of producers and the interests of consumers in every country saddled with protectionist policies. It also creates conflict between nations. U.S. exports fell dramatically as a result of the Smoot-Hawley tariff. 
As the tariffs hit American consumers and they imported less from abroad, their suppliers were able to purchase less from Americans, and American exports collapsed. American export industries were devastated by a bill designed to protect American industries from foreign competition. In the end, the policy was a disaster for America. American exporters understood the economics that the politicians did not. The European director of General Motors, Graham Howard, sent a telegram to President Hoover warning that the passage of the Smoot-Hawley tariff would spell economic isolation for the United States and would cause the most severe depression ever experienced. History proved him right. Protectionism was a disaster for the United States economy, but it turned out to be a disaster for the world, too. Raising tariff walls creates tension and hostility among countries. When the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act was becoming law, foreign affairs worried about the future of the world, not only the economic but the political future, and they read all the things that were going on in the European papers and reported what the Europeans were saying. And one of the things that was quite interesting is that the Swedish paper said of the Smoot-Hawley tariff, here it is, it was the most terrible blow against the economic life of the world. A Spanish newspaper said the U.S. was trampling on fair competition and on the peaceful spirit of the world. So they saw right away, these newspapers, that the consequences of a U.S. tariff, of U.S. being cavalier even about trade, would be political, diplomatic, and would affect the future of democracy on the continent. As country after country raised tariffs and blocked international trade, the world fell into depression. Within two years of passage of the Smoot-Hawley tariff in the United States, the volume of international trade had collapsed by 70 percent. And with the collapse of trade came more or unemployment, poverty, and the rise of extremism. Protectionism had contributed enormously to crashing the world economy and the terrible consequences to follow. As economist Martin Wolf of Oxford University and the Financial Times said of the experience, this collapse in trade was a huge spur to the search for autarky and Lebensraum, most of all for Germany and Japan. Was protectionism the right policy in 1930? Is it the right answer to the current financial crisis? Not according to economists who have studied the period. Professor Jagdish Bhagwati of Columbia University is a renowned expert on the issue. Today, after the twin crisis, financial crisis and the macroeconomic crisis, many people think that somehow that has created a, a, a justification for protectionism. But protectionism relates to goods trade, to, to services trade. It relates to trade issues. The financial crisis relates to financial issues. Stopping trade won't solve problems rooted in the financial sector. Like the Smoot-Hawley tariff and the process of retaliation it set off around the world, protectionism will only make things worse without addressing any underlying problems. Stopping trade won't cure our economic crisis. It threatens instead to make it much, much worse as it did in the 1930s. Economists from around the world have joined together to protect free trade from the protectionists who want to stop trade, you can join them by signing the petition for free trade at www.freedomtotrade.org. This is a truly international effort uniting people from all over the planet. I'm Ali Huang from China and I'm proud to stand up for the freedom to trade. I am Gabriel Araújo from Brazil and I'm proud to stand up for the freedom to trade. I'm William Arnold from the United States, and I'm proud to stand up for the freedom to trade. I'm Nadine Abdallah from Lebanon, and I'm proud to stand up for the freedom to trade. My name is Emmanuel Martin from France, and I'm proud to stand up for the freedom to trade. I am Juno Runga from Kenya, and I'm proud to stand up for the freedom to trade. I don't want to return to the failed policies that crashed the world economy in the 1930s. Please join me and people from all over the world in our campaign to say no to protectionism.